So are you excited to go to your dad's? Excited? I know he can be difficult sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I know he's my dad and all, but... It just seems like we can never have a normal conversation, you know? Our discussions turn into debates. Whenever I try to get him to listen, he winds up lecturing. It's not good enough for him to be the smartest guy in the room. He has to make sure you know he's the smartest guy in the room. You know, you got that from him, you know. Not the arrogance. The smarts. I don't feel that way when I'm around him. He always finds this way of making you feel dumb. He invalidates everything I say, you know, school stuff, sports opinions, stuff I read, religion. Well, you better get used to that one. This day and age that we live in, everybody would try to question your religion. Now, you're a smart kid. You're going to go to college and you're going to make something of yourself. But don't think for one second that somebody won't question your religion. You just got to be ready for it, honey. Alex? 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 Oh, hey. Dude, you were out of it, huh? Yeah, um... I guess I was, yeah. I'm Gabby, third year on the team. Alex, first year. How'd you know my name? Yeah. Oh. Welcome to the team. What are you studying? Pre-law. Nice. Freshman? No, uh, senior. I graduated in the spring. You waited a while to join the team, huh? Yeah, well, better late than never, right? Right. Any advice for a newbie? Professor Wallace can be tough. Just get on his good side early. Wallace? Yeah. Well, well, what do we have here? Welcome to the debate team. You've got to be a pretty distinctive person to join the debate team. I don't know exactly what your goals are in life. Become a, a lawyer, a politician, a teacher. Regardless, you like to hear yourself talk. You like to be right. You like to debate. These are all the things you share in common with me. <laughs> but before we're ready for competitions and tournaments and all the fun things that we're inevitably here for, I've got to train you. I've got to mold you. You wouldn't want to play in a basketball tournament on day one, would you? It takes practice. Now, our first tournament is in a month, and I have until then to whip you into shape and see what you're made of. Each week, we'll take a topic and debate it. I'll give you a thesis and divide the class into affirmative and negative sides. And each of you will take a shot at convincing me if I'm right or if you believe that I'm wrong. Good luck with that. All right. We will start trial debates today. And when we convene again on Wednesday with a final debate taking place on Friday, we'll start with one of my favorite topics, religion. So here's the thesis. The biographies of Jesus cannot be trusted. There is no credible proof Jesus was the Son of God. Therefore, Christianity is an invalid religion. I know this would be a touchy subject for some people, but touchy on this team is good. I want emotion. I want convictions. I want you to defend your creed. This is what will help me to mold you into the debaters I need you to be. Let's get started. Affirmative side here, 
negative side here. Take this. Now, I bought this a long time ago when I first started going to church. And it's been a reminder to me ever since to keep Jesus first. So whenever times would get difficult or if I question my faith, I look down at it and it gave me strength. Maybe it'll do the same for you. Well, this is cool. Thanks. You're welcome, honey. Are we a little conflicted, Alex? No, sir. Not at all. Very well. Let's get things started. Go ahead and pick a person to represent your sides and come to the front. I'll take it. Alex, why don't you begin? Professor, you claim that the biographies of Jesus cannot be trusted. But my question to you is, don't we rely on ancient literature and biographies such as these for all of our historical evidence? So what makes the Bible so different? How do you know President Lincoln was ever president? Or that he was ever assassinated? Have you seen him? Could you conjure up some sort of equation that would prove his existence? Of course not. You believe in President Lincoln because of old writings. You've read them. This is the same evidence we look to for Jesus of Nazareth. Though, not as recent as that of President Lincoln, this evidence is more credible than that of Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Homer, Plato, or any other historical okay, figure that- Okay, hold on here, let me get this straight. You're comparing the existence of a man who supposedly was divine, did no wrong, worked miracles, and lived over 2,000 years ago to that of President Lincoln? A man who lived only 200 years ago? A man who we have recent writings of? A man who we have pictures of? A man who we have documents signed by? Oh, and um, not to mention, his face is on our money. I guess I've never had the privilege of holding a Jesus bill in my hands. <laughs> no, no, what I was saying oh, was- we heard what you were saying, Alex. I just respectfully disagree. Professor, isn't it prohibited to interrupt the presentation. I'll allow it. Thank you. You see, Professor, I'm a simple girl. I'm a person of science, reason, and evidence. I simply follow the facts where they go. Christians, however, call themselves people of faith, right? Well, what is the definition of faith? It is believing in something, even though you have absolutely no proof for it. And the basis of this thesis is if I am going to give my life to a cause and believe in a mythical God, there needs to be proof. Alex, have you ever played the game Telephone? Of course. Good. Then you know how this works. I tell something to you, you tell it to someone else, and so on and so forth. By the time it gets to the end of the class, it's been completely changed from what it originally was. Now, take this same concept, but we're living in the early 80s. We're talking about something that we didn't see happen. The game is spread across thousands of people, and those playing are religious fanatics who want the outcome of the game to change. Does that sound more credible to you than writings of President Lincoln, who were written only 150 years ago while that man was still alive? Not to me. I'll end with this, Professor. When the ancient Greeks would look at certain phenomena like earthquakes or even rain, they couldn't explain it, so they'd come up with their own explanations. Things like, the gods are angry or the gods are crying. They were filling in the gaps of knowledge of things that they couldn't understand. But now, all these years later, what do we know? We know that earthquakes are caused by tectonic plates, and we know that rain is simply atmospheric water vapor heavy enough to fall under the weight of gravity. Class! Professor, Alex, the gaps have been filled. We have more than enough science and evidence in the modern era to know that there is no more need to believe in God. The gods aren't crying, Alex. It is just 
simply raining. How do you guys like your coffee? Works fine. Alex? Oh, uh, yeah, black's good. So obviously that didn't go well, but we still have two more chances to win this baby. So let's do it. What you got? So what I think is we stay with his Lincoln rebuttal because that was a good point, but Sarah interrupted him. So I said we stick with that. Hey, Alex. It's okay, we were all caught off guard. We still have two more chances to win. You know, I come from a broken family. My parents were never married. My mom was a drug addict, so when I was born, my dad got custody of me. Not having a mom in my life really messed me up, you know? But when I was 14, I attended a youth camp and encountered God for the first time ever. I was never the same. Since then, I've reconciled with my mom, helped her get rehabilitated, and she's been sober for over a year now. Guys, this is a cause I believe in. I know this is just a practice debate, but I'm gonna do everything I can to win. So on Wednesday, let me present our side. No. Please, I wanna present. Alex, it's fine, we're a team, we can divide and conquer. Please, Gabby, this is important for me. This is something I need to do. Okay. You know, someone questioned my faith once. Yeah, I was in high school. This girl used to pick on me all the time. And her name was Brenda. She was the principal's daughter, so she thought she can get away with whatever she wanted. And she was right. Nobody messed with her. And on top of that, she was really pretty. So all the boys wanted to be with her. And, and here I was, this little Christian kid, just walking around, determined to save everybody. Well, one day Brenda was picking on me. It's about something. I, till this day, I, I can't remember what it was. Oh, but she just kept going on about how God wasn't real. And if I would just stop wasting my time going to church, then maybe a boy might be interested in me. So what did you do? But I did what I always did. I cried. <laughs> but I was determined, though, not to let her win. So after school, I went to the library and I stayed there all night. You know, I was reading books, reading documents, just collecting all kinds of historical evidence about Jesus. Man, I spent hours and hours at that library. I made sure that every single thing that I wanted to say to her, I wrote it down in my notebook. And I went to school the next day. I debated her. Did you win? So with all of that being said, for a religion that has been the cause of so many wars and so much strife, for a religion like that to base their entire creed on literature passed down from generation to generation, back with no historical evidence whatsoever, just seems to me, Professor, to be simply irresponsible. I, mean, I don't know about you guys, but it's hard enough for me to remember what we discussed in class a few weeks ago, long enough to write it down on my exams. <laughs> But for some reason, these manuscripts need to be taken word for word. Just seems a little rational to me. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Rob. Well, at least someone is adding some common sense into the equation. Alex, I see you want to take another crack at it? Yes, sir. Well, go ahead. Thank you, Professor. Professor, are you aware of something called the Dead Sea Scrolls? Of course. It's the only argument Christians are ever cognizant of. <laughs> the question was rhetorical, Professor. I know you know what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. The truth of the matter is, you've done much more studying than I in this and many other subjects. And if I had to guess, 
you've probably done even more research on this particular topic than you even had to, correct? So let me bring up some things you've probably read about in your study. You've probably read that the scrolls found in that cave were dated long before and after the time of Christ. Precisely the same as thousands of years ago, word for word, identical to the original Hebrew text. Now, I wonder if, in your research, you found any other piece of information so historically confirmed. Or maybe you'd like to address Sarah's point from Monday. Maybe you'd like to tell her that the gospel accounts of Jesus were written as soon as 30 years after the time of his death by individuals who walked with him and saw the things he did. So to me, that seems much more credible than the writings of Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great that were written hundreds of years after they died. And I'm sorry, Robert, for your mental lapse, but I made an A on my last college exam, so I can't quite sympathize with you on that one. You see, in the Jewish tradition, the adding or, or the changing of scripture was punishable by hell. This isn't Brian staying up until 2 a.m. writing his 50-page essay and making a few typos. This was serious stuff. Professor, I know you know this, but there are over 300 prophecies written in the Old Testament about the coming of Christ. Can you guess how many he fulfilled? Every single one. Virgin birth, born in Bethlehem, came from the lineage of David, beaten, vinegar to drink, hands nailed, feet pierced, even the bartering for his clothes. It was all prophesied beforehand. Brian, you're from Texas, right? Yes, sir. The chances of eight of these prophecies coming true is like taking your beautiful state, filling it completely with silver dollars two feet deep, marking one of them, and then having a blind person find that exact one on the first try. <laughs> the whole state, huh? And exactly how did you find that statistic? Science Speaks by Dr. Peter Stoner. It's an old book, Professor. The same place we get all of our information from. Alex, you do realize that Jesus wasn't the only person crucified, right? I mean, it was a very common practice at the time. These prophecies could have come true for a number of different people. Actually, Robert, the prophecies about crucifixion were written in the Old Testament hundreds of years before crucifixion was ever even invented. You see, this probability that I just shared with you was for eight prophecies to come true. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies. This number, it's completely unfathomable to the human brain. Sarah, you call this people of faith. But I think it is you all who are the people of faith because with these numbers that I presented to you today, it takes more faith not to believe than it does to believe. Thank you, Professor. The fact that I can't even explain God just makes me believe in him even more. I mean, if I could explain him, then he could just be some human invention, but I can't. I mean, that's got to mean something. No, that's not good enough. Wallace isn't going to buy that for a second. We need something more concrete than that. I think I need to hit the Dead Sea Scrolls harder. They have images of the manuscripts online, and we can prove that it's word for word from the original text. Yeah, I think that could maybe help, but I think Brian's onto something. I mean, as Christians, shouldn't we at some point bring up testimony? How he's changed our lives, how he's changed other people's testimony, lives. Testimony, Gabby? Seriously, testimony is going to prove the legitimacy of Jesus Christ? We have so many more concrete things that we haven't even brought up yet. The fact that he appeared to over 500 eyewitnesses legitimizing his resurrection. The fact that the early martyrs who saw Jesus with their own eyes went around living their lives for his cause. I mean, we haven't even mentioned a word about Josephus and all of his writings. And here you want me to bring up your little youth cap story? I'm sorry. I... Did you win? Did you win the debate? 
No, I didn't. I came at him ready. Oh, I was ready to prove her wrong. But I was angry at her for challenging me. And that anger displayed itself in my presentation. Everything that I learned that night, all the facts, I presented it to her. But it just, you know, it just made her more angry at me, you know. And it just turned into this big argument and it resulted in the both of us being suspended. So Brenda continued to be an atheist and no one ever trusted anything I had to say after that. So I was right back to where I started. This Christian girl just trying to convert everyone. You know the way I treated Brenda? I treated your dad the same way. We argued all the time. Never got anywhere. Look, if you want your dad to know who Jesus is, then you have to treat him the way Jesus would. And the difference that Jesus has made in your life would make all of the difference in his, okay? Yeah, I think I could do that. Yeah, I know you can. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> mean so much to him? Why does he even care? Brian, I think this might explain it. Look at his name. Alex. Alex Wallace. Hey, Dad. Hey, son. I would try so hard to make him proud. I knew that grades were important to him, so I would study and study for hours just to try and make him happy. When it came time to take the ACT in high school, I knew that was my chance. I just knew that if I got a good score, he'd finally be proud. So for weeks, I did nothing but study. No social life, no fun, just studying. When I finally got the results, my score was a 35. <laughs> I was so proud of myself that I ran up to him to show him and do you know what he said? All that studying and you couldn't even get a perfect score. It was at that moment I decided to omit him from my life completely. But I couldn't shake his influence on me. He was the reason I wanted to be a lawyer. The reason why, after three years of school, I decided to join this team. He gave me that desire to debate, to prove it, to prove that I'm smart, and to make sure guys like him don't win. I haven't seen my father in years. I had no idea he was the professor of this team. But when I saw him walk through those doors, it was like I was that same stupid kid again, just trying to get a perfect score. I know how you feel. It was the same thing with my mom. Like, no matter how detrimental her behavior was, I couldn't stop myself from caring. It was only after I stopped trying to fix her that she was ever restored. Loving her is what ultimately made the impact. But you've heard that little youth camp story already, haven't you? God got me. I'm so sorry about that. It's okay. 
I want you to debate for us tomorrow. You know what you have to do. Come on, let's go see if Brian has a youth camp story. <laughs> So in conclusion, Professor, we have laid out multiple different arguments throughout the course of this past week. I believe we proved that there is more than reasonable doubt to believe in the legitimacies of the outlandish claims that have been made by, dare I say, religious fanatics, not only in this room, but by those all around the world. And let me conclude with this final question. Are you willing to give your life to, or even believe in, a story that has been responsible for so many wars, hate crimes, prejudice, rhetoric, and so forth? Are you willing to believe in such a story like this? Whenever reasonable doubt, scientific facts, and common sense declare this story to be completely and utterly fictional? If your answer is yes, I simply cannot join with you and risk being on the wrong side of history. Thank you, Professor. Oh, thank you, Laura. I reason with your logical concerns, but like any other, there are two sides to this coin. So, who will be presenting the other side today? I will, sir. <laughs> Alex, it seems your teammates have more faith in you than Jesus Christ. <laughs> Good luck. My fellow teammates, Professor, this entire week we have been debating and discussing a story. A story about a man that has literally changed and shaped our entire human history. Our calendars, our holidays, our morality, even our constitution. All changed and shaped by one man, one story. Now you all declare this story to be fictional. And I've spent these past few days giving you countless examples of why you are wrong. And I can continue to do that today. I can stand up here and tell you about the 500 eyewitnesses that Jesus Christ revealed himself to after the resurrection. I can even tell you about the writings of ancient secular historians like that of Josephus, who, though not a Christian himself, writes about Jesus less than 100 years after his death. I can even tell you about the eyewitnesses and thousands of others who would have rather died as martyrs than to deny what they had personally seen and experienced. Facts, historical evidence, all legitimizing this story that you all claim to be fiction. But I want to discuss a different story with you today. A story about a young girl born out to a drug addicted mother and a confused father only having brokenness displayed in front of her until she inherited it herself. No self-worth, no identity. But while attending a youth camp at the age of 14, she encountered a story so powerful that she gave her entire life to the author. She discovered her worth, found her identity, reconciled with her mother, and now her mother, after hearing that same story, has been sober for almost two years. How about another story? This one about a boy. Growing up in a Southern culture demanding and dictating how he, as a man, should act, what he should wear, what his hobbies should be, and how he should treat people. He was so caught up in this image that he was pursuing that he never stopped for a moment to think about if he even liked the image in the first place. He woke up one day to realize that he was an alcoholic, working a dead-end job, and taking advantage of women every chance that he got just to feed his own ego until one day he encountered a story, a story so powerful that he gave his entire life to the author. That boy is now a man, fulfilled yet accomplished, caring and completely sober, nothing like the image he once pursued. One more story, this one of another boy Growing up in a broken family with a father who a father who took every opportunity to let this boy know that he was not as smart as him. Yet all that boy ever wanted was for him to love him and for him 
to be proud. He tried his entire life to do everything that he could just to hear him say good job, but it always ended the same way. Disappointment. Until one day the cycle turned into cynicism. His pursuit then pivoted into a different desire. To be nothing like the man that his father was. And even though I hated him, even though I despise the very thought of him, I stand before that man today with nothing but love and compassion in my heart. Because I heard a story. A story so powerful that I gave my entire life to the author. You asked us at the beginning of this week to give proof. Proof as to why we believe Jesus is who he says he is. And if what I just said doesn't prove it to you, then I'm sorry. I simply cannot follow you in that belief. Because I can't risk being on the wrong side of eternity. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Dad. <clears throat> um. Thank you, Alex. All right. Um, I need to announce uh, the winner of, of these debates. My accommodations to, to both sides. Both sides debated valiantly. You know. These debates are one on facts, presentations, and, uh, and strategy. One side, I, I believe, match these criteria more efficiently and effectively than the other. So, the winner of these debates. I never knew you felt those ways. Never asked. You know my father was a drunk. He worked the same dead-end job his entire life. He knew he was a low life, and he took it out on me. I worked so hard to make something of myself, studying every moment of every day just so I can be an intellectual contribution to society. The very opposite of my father. I guess when you were born, I saw you as a hindrance to that goal. Did you, did you ever even love mom? Of course I did. More than anything, she was the one thing that made me feel human, like I had a purpose. And then she started bringing religion around, and she got pregnant. It just seemed like one big obstacle. This whole God thing, just nothing in my life indicated that this person existed. Well, Dad, my life is the complete opposite. My entire life is proof that he exists. The fact that I'm standing here right now is proof that he exists. Mom, she's proof that he exists. This whole cycle of dysfunctional fathers and men, it ends with me. I refuse to let that be a part of my life. But it can end with you too. Just like I've broken up with this unhealthy pursuit of 
identity in my life, you can break it in yours too. And then your life can become the proof, just like mine. Maybe. See you Monday, son. Hey, son. Good job in the debate today. Proud of you.